Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core training on finding and using community level data on DataShare, as well as some other sources. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your hosts today. Today's session, as you can hear, is held with English with Spanish, sorry, is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate written comments and questions in the chat. Soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. And we're also joined today by Eva Holt, who um, is our expert on all things data share, and she'll be fielding any questions you may have um, specifically about data share. We turn it over to Nicole Young, who's going to give us a brief overview of CORE. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we think of it as both a funding model and a broader effort or movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And through many years of collaboration and uh, input and, and sharing insights uh, from many partners in local governments, philanthropy, nonprofits, and different community groups, We've arrived at this mission statement and vision statement for core investments that really speaks to core as both a, a funding model and that broader effort or movements with equity at the center. And when we use phrases like equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan need to have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being so that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, uh, and many other types of uh, dimensions of diversity and other social identities. So then when we think about CORE in this way as both a funding model and a movement, it provides us a framework to align priorities and programs and policies and funding and results around a set of community-wide goals and then work together to create these core conditions for health and well-being. And equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate and remind us that we have to examine and address our beliefs, our practices and structures at all levels, individual, organizational, and systemic, uh, because those are the things that often perpetuate the very inequities that we are determined to eliminate. And we want to take a moment just to uh, show and highlight the equity statement that the County of Santa Cruz recently adopted. Uh, it is also mentioned in the core investments request for proposals or RFP. And so uh, some of the phrases that we have here in bold around transformative process, unwavering support, dignity and compassion ensuring intentional opportunities and access so that everyone can thrive and belong. It's very consistent with the mission and vision for core investments that I just described. And then on the next slide, you'll see the definition of equity that is again included in the RFP in the glossary that starts on page 49. So again, this is just something we wanna keep in mind as we are holding these trainings as you're thinking about responding to the questions in the application, uh, because you'll see over and over in the, in the RFP, in the application that you'll be asked to address how your proposed program will be addressing inequities and increasing equity. And trainings like today, as well as, well as other Core Institute events like coffee chats, um, are offered today through the what we call the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. So think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of core investments, where we offer an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities and capacity building for people across sectors to build that shared knowledge, skills, and systems that we need 
to fulfill that collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. And hopefully you all know uh, this information by now, but just want to point out again that you can find information about the current core investments RFP in a couple different places, both on the county's website, on the general services department page, as well as the human services department's website. That's kind of like the one-stop shop to find all of the information that you would need. And also just wanna highlight and remind everyone about a couple key dates. Uh, we are providing training and technical assistance all the way up through the application due date. The Human Services Department just posted the first question and answers document on its website. They did that last Friday. Um, they will post the, the second and final Q&A document on July 8th. And so it's really important to remember that the last day to submit questions to that core funding email address is July 1st, and then applications due August 2nd. And I'll say more about this in a moment, but again, you probably are aware that in this round of funding, there are particular uh, core conditions and impact statements that have been prioritized for the RFP funding. There will be a separate funding process to award core funds in the stable affordable housing and shelter core condition. St there are still no updates or decisions that have been made that, uh, so we, we still don't have answers to the questions about how that will happen. But what we can do, what we are here to offer uh, is a, a, an array of training and technical assistance or TA again, throughout the application period. So Nicole Lezen, our colleague Crystal Caballero, and I will be um, your TA providers. And so just to, again, some of you have heard this already, but we'll say it again, that we can't do things like tell you whether to apply or what core condition to apply under or you know, how you should design your programs to have the best chances of getting awarded funding. So we can't tell you that mostly because we don't know. Uh, we don't know your programs. We don't know how the reviewers are going to uh, review and score other than we know what scoring instructions and th what the scoring rubric looks like. So we're really here to just provide guidance and support to you, um, provide resources and tools to help you think about how you want to apply certain concepts and tools that are mentioned in the RFP. And we're doing that through things like structured trainings, like today's, where we'll come with a presentation and content. And also through office hours that are more informal. It's really, you come with your questions and we talk through them together with whoever also shows up. And then there, there are more individualized TA sessions where you can have up to two sessions per application and it will be either with Nicole or Crystal or me where we can help talk you through some of the questions or you know, be your thought partners and brainstorm partners if that's, um, if that's helpful to you. We are suggesting that if you're interested in TA sessions to sign up now for an initial session between basically between now and July 8th. We have a set of uh, options and dates that were available. Sign up for your initial TA session now, and then we'll work with you to schedule your second TA session. So we're trying to make sure that everything doesn't get all bunched up <laughs> at the end. Okay, so that's enough about the training and TA. So we're going to do a brief poll here before we launch into our agenda and our content for today. So we wanna get a sense given today's topic how much community level data is available from any source for your proposed project? Do you feel like there's a lot and you just need to sort through it and figure out what to use, what's most relevant? Do you have some, but you're actively looking for more? Are you feeling like, yeah, we've looked, but there's not much, or you just don't know. And you're really just kind of in your initial stage of starting to explore the data landscape for your project. Okay, so it looks like the responses have, uh, have come in and kind of slowed down. So I'm gonna end the poll. 
share the results so that we can see. Looks like quite a few of you are saying that you have some, that you uh, have found some, but you're still actively looking for more. And then we do have one person who has a lot. And so that's great because you'll see that <laughs> later on, we'll invite suggestions about, you know, if you found other sources beyond what's on data share, uh, if you're willing to share that, um, we, we welcome that. And then uh, at least a couple of you saying not much so far and you're, you're looking for more. So hopefully today might spark some ideas that will be useful to you. Okay, so thanks for doing that poll. Here's our agenda for today. Um, so we just finished the overview of CORE. I am going to do a little bit of a review and just again to orient ourselves to the questions in the RFP or the application that are specifically asking for community level data. So we'll do that and also offer a, a just kind of a refresher about the core conditions and the impact statements. Cause I know that some of you, at least in some of the office hours and TA sessions we've had so far, that's been a big question about how do I under how do I understand these enough to then know how to go about um, selecting which one to apply under. But then the bulk of our time together today will be focused on um, ideas and tips and additional resources for finding data to support your statement of needs and strengths in the application, uh, as well as some tips about how to cite your data sources, especially given the character counts and how limited they are, and some prompts to help you think about how to make sense of your data as you're writing your application and kind of building the case for your program. And then we'll wrap up with any final questions and next steps. Okay, so just a quick recap and overview of just the structure of the application. It's divided into these sections. Hopefully you're, you're somewhat familiar with these already, these uh, components, and then the amount of points that are assigned or the, or the possible um, maximum number of points that can be awarded to each component or section. And so the, the part we're going to focus mostly on today is the statement of needs and strengths, the why do it, because that really is where there's an explicit question asking you to describe data and, um, and cite it. So that's what we'll focus on. We do highly recommend that you keep going back to the scoring scale, the scoring rubric, uh, to really understand what it is that reviewers will be told to be looking for as they are reviewing and scoring application responses. We always suggest looking at, okay, what is considered an exemplary response? And you'll see that in the scoring rubric, there are like, it's kind of broken out. There are multiple things that reviewers will be looking for. So as you're writing your proposals, you'll want to keep looking at the question, looking at your response, comparing that to the scoring rubric and seeing, did I answer all of those parts of the question? Um, so that's just our tip, like keep studying, keep going back to the scoring scale. The application itself, in terms of this section on the statement of needs and strengths, there are again, a couple of specific questions here. So on the next slide, you'll see question four, this is the one that asks you to specifically describe how inequities contribute to the need, challenge, or issue the program that you're proposing will address and who it impacts, who the inequities impact. And as part of answering that question, you'll need to include and identify relevant data from secondary sources, such as those listed on DataShare or other websites. So secondary data, from data share or other websites and or data from primary sources, meaning people that you've talked to. So that could be staff, could be participants, it could be the community through town halls or focus groups, okay? And then the key, one of the keys here is that you need to be sure that the needs, challenges or issues you're describing are related to the core condition and impact statement you've selected. So you'll actually have to make that explicit for the readers. The next slide just shows that same question in Spanish, in case you're involving any community members or participants in your planning process and you want them to be able to see what it is that you have to respond to. 
The next slide shows question five. This is also part of the statement of needs and strengths where you're describing community strengths or assets that can be leveraged by your program to help address the inequities that you've described in question four. And so even though this question doesn't explicitly say and include data, this would be another good place to include data on strengths and assets, whether that comes from secondary sources like DataShare or other websites or primary sources like, again, participants, focus groups, the community, et cetera. Again, you'll see that same question in Spanish. And now I'm gonna, again, just walk through, hopefully this actually does sound familiar and I'm only repeating what you already know, but we're finding that it doesn't hurt to um, say this again, show this in a slightly different way, uh, because it is really critical that uh, before you get too far into your <laughs> proposal writing, that you're really clear on which core condition and impact statement you are applying under and that you've done some of that pre-thinking about here's how I'll connect the dots between my program's activities, our outcomes, and the core conditions and impacts. So on the next slide, you'll see just kind of, this is kind of everything all at once, the all eight core conditions, that graphic that we show over and over that really it's not only showing the eight core conditions and what each of them are called, but also those dotted lines that connect all of those icons is really important also in terms of showing and communicating how interconnected and interdependent the core conditions are. So even though the county has only selected three of the core conditions for this funding cycle, for this current RFP, it's also important to just remember how, again, connected they all are. So the impact statements, what you're seeing on the screen here are kind of like abbreviated versions of the impact statements under each core condition. So you'll see there's anywhere from three to five impact statements for each core condition. The ones that have been prioritized for this RFP are in bold font. And then on the next slide, you'll see the same information in Spanish. And they'll just focus on the core conditions that again, have been selected and prioritized for this current RFP. Um, because these, the, the way we have it on these slides is it actually then shows or provides that broad definition of what we mean by each core condition. So when we think about lifelong learning and education, what we mean by that core condition is high quality education and learning opportunities from birth to end of life. So basically the age range is already built into that definition of the core condition. So it's really thinking about from birth to end of life, all ages. Um, and for this RFP, the prioritized impact is about equitable access to those high quality education and learning opportunities. And so the thinking here is that in order to get to some of those later impacts or other impacts around skills and educational achievement or attainment, that first we have to ensure that there's equitable access to those learning opportunities and education. So that's the one that's been prioritized for this funding cycle. When it comes to thriving families, what we mean by that is that everybody needs to have safe, nurturing relationships and environments that promote optimal health and well-being for all family members across generations. So at the broadest level, what we mean by that core condition is family is like however people identify family. It's all, all the family members across all generations, right? Um, and then for this particular RFP cycle, the impacts that have been prioritized are increased resilience of children and youth and increased resilience among older and dependent adults. So the county did just define in the questions and answers document that was released last Friday that children and youth are defining as birth up to 24 years old and older adults they're defining as 60 years and older and dependent adults are basically 18 to 60 years old that have physical or mental um, 
conditions or challenges that uh, make it hard to uh, go about their everyday lives on their own, that they need assistance or support to do that. And then with healthy environments, what we mean by that in terms of that core condition are a clean, safe, sustainable, natural environment and a built environment and infrastructure that support health and well-being. Okay, so that's a lot of uh, <laughs> words in there, a little bit jargony, but think of, think of environment as either things that exist in nature uh, or, or as well as things that have been created by humans. That's what we mean by built environment and infrastructure. And so the impact statements really kind of sp um, speak to like different uh, types of those environments. The impact statements that has been prioritized for this RFP is the one that focuses on safe, affordable, accessible recreational spaces, which if we think about recreational spaces broadly, that could include right, the natural environment like beaches, forests, rivers, et cetera, um, or the built environment, things created by humans, playgrounds, recreational centers and facilities, bike paths, right? So um, you can think about recreational spaces in a, in a fairly flexible way. So we wanted to review all of that, that refresher about core conditions and impact statements because there were a number of questions that were submitted to the county about how broadly or narrowly, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, Nicole, there were a number of questions about how broadly or narrowly can the core conditions and impact statements be interpreted? And there were a number of questions about whether or how much a program needs to align with the indicators in the core dashboard or core results menu on data share. Um, and so the response that the county provided is that it really is up to the applicant to demonstrate the connection between the core condition and the impact statement you've selected and your proposed program. And the indicators that you see on data share under each of the impact statements may be included in your proposals, but they're not the only source of inf data of information that you have to include. So you're not required to use data on data share. Um, and so that really is what we're going to focus on. Both show how, or give you some tips about how to find data that might be relevant to your proposal, but also where else might you look if you're not finding what you need on data share. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. So as Nicole reviewed earlier, the questions number four and number five in the RFP ask you to use quantitative and qualitative data to document inequities and identify and describe the community strengths, needs, challenges, and issues related to the core conditions and impact statements that Nicole just reviewed. So in our session today, we'll be sharing some tips and tools to find data, starting with data share. But again, as Nicole said, we just want to remind everyone, it's not the only place to look and it's not required that you use data share if the data relevant to your program are more available elsewhere. So it's just, it's a starting point. And if it's helpful to you, great. But if it's not, um, feel free to, to search for other sources. And the, another reminder that these questions four and five in the RFP are where you start making your case by answering the question of why you're doing your program in the first place. And it's, it's an opportunity to demonstrate what you know best, what you know about your community's needs and challenges, why those needs and challenges exist, what strengths and assets are part of the equation and how equity plays a role. So you're setting the stage for those reviewers to um, let them know how your idea or program is really well positioned to address those needs or challenges. But there's a limited character count. And as we'll discuss later, the, the challenge this RFP is going to be to focus the information that's most relevant. So we hope this will give you some ideas on how to do that. So let's start with what community level data are in the first place. Um, 
The RFP has in its glossary on starting on page 49, a definition of uh, community-wide indicators that's a specific quality or state that can be measured across a population group, community, or geographic area rather than an individual. So that parenthetical um, definition rather than an individual is really key here. It's, it's broader than just what's happening in a particular program. And you're trying to uh, track what's happening in an, in an entire community. So more than what any particular um, agency or program can accomplish alone. And that's important because it's not just up to you or your program to move the needle on these community level indicators, like the ones that you're seeing on DataShare, but you do need to describe how your program or activities and outcomes would contribute to those improvements in community level or community-wide indicators that are related to the core conditions and impact statements that you've selected. So again, that's why we highly recommend going through the exercise of creating a theory of change or logic model for your proposed program, which we covered in a previous training and Gisela is posting a link to that in the chat, because that can really help you organize the ideas and where your program fits in these broader um, community-wide indicators. So just to test some of what we've just described, um, which ones of these do you think are community level data? So we've got some options here, the percentage of Santa Cruz County children who've had a dental visit in the last year or 12 months, the number of children who visited a dentist in a particular zip code, the dental visits that are offered in a year at a particular clinic, this one's made up, the Healthy Smiles Clinic, and the number of oral health providers in California. Which ones do you think are community level indicators? Does anybody wanna raise their hand or maybe offer something in the chat? Just a reminder, we're, we're working with the definition in the RFP of a specific quality or state that can be measured across a population group, community, or geographic area rather than an individual. Or if it's easier, is there one that's not a community level indicator? Any takers? Okay, so Lynn thinks- Nicole. Yes. This is Cheryl. Um, I thought mo many of them were, but the last one definitely was not from the entire state of California. It's not local. Not community level. Okay. I'm sorry, not community level, yeah. And you've got some agreement there from Lynn and Liz. Okay. So let me make a case for actually C, dental visits offered in a year at a particular clinic is not community-wide because it's one program or agency or setting. The denominator, the number of people who might need treatment who this clinic is trying to serve might be a community level indicator. And I expect that you could make an argument that a geographic area as broad as a state might be considered a community. It, the idea is broader, broader than a program, broader than a particular agency or clinic. Um, it's the context in which you are providing your services. So you're the people you're serving are a, a subset or a fraction of some broader community. And what these questions, the community level indicators are trying to get at, what is the backdrop in which you're offering your services? What's the broader context? So in that sense, you know, we, we could discuss it and 
um, go back and forth on it. But in that sense, the number of providers in a state is, is considered a community level indicator for the state because it provides a context for perhaps the shortage of providers, for example, or the scarcity of services. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So again, when you're looking at these community level um, data in, in data share or elsewhere, just try to think about it more broadly than, than your program or service, but affecting your program or service. So they're linked. You're, you're, you're trying to address that community level indicator but you alone are not responsible for solving the access to dental care crisis in our state or our county. Questions? Comments? All right, let us know in the chat or raise your hand if, you, if this is still confusing at all. But Nicole. We'll yeah. Um, just just one point of clarification, like when you asked the question, um, I made an assumption that I want to check out. And my assumption was this funding is coming from the county of Santa Cruz is also coming from the city of Santa Cruz. And my assumption was that they would find very interesting data that impacts those two areas. Is that an accurate assumption? The, the funding is local in that sense, county and city. And absolutely, the more local data that you are able to, um, to show, to illustrate, the need for your program, the um, responsiveness of your program to local needs, the better. But that's also, it's also true that um, sometimes we don't have local data for everything. And sometimes things like a state trend are relevant to the program that we're trying to create or, or implement. So the fact that there's a state level data point if there isn't, a, if there is a local counterpart, absolutely use the, the local ones if you can, but that's not always available to you and it's still relevant if there's a state issue. Yeah, and let me just um, say where I'm coming from with that question. We have chosen and purposefully not include, we have regional data. Of, but you gave a great example of there's a lack of resources available in the state. Well, there's a lack of resources and connection available in the region, and we end up serving other counties. But given the premise or the assumption that I talked about earlier, we haven't been including any of that kind of information. And now I question whether or not we should. And that might be true for others on this training. Yeah, I think there's a question in the RFP about um, ensuring that you are serving, uh, that you, first of all, that you're located in Santa Cruz County and that you're serving Santa Cruz County residents. So I think that's a fair assumption. Yeah, I think that's why I made that assumption in the past because it seemed very Santa Cruz centric. So I, I haven't ventured out and put a whole lot of data. We've put some national data um, because there's very obvious things going on with LGBTQ plus nationally, and that has been useful. Um, but I, I have shied away from anything beyond county. Yeah, so there, and again, um, thanks for bringing that up, but I think there are different ways to use regional, state, and national broader data. So if you're talking about this is a broader issue that we're struggling with here in our county and here's how we're trying to respond locally, that's one way to sort of set the stage and talk about the issues yeah. related to equity. But a different issue is who you're serving um, and who is appearing at your door for services. And that is where you do want to be more hyper-local with the art. Yeah. Great points. Yeah. They're not mutually exclusive is what I'm trying to say. The context, the broader context and the services. 
Yeah, those are great points. Boy, you have to be careful, though, don't you? (laughs) Yeah, and that's why we're trying to spend time on each of these sections of the RFP in this much detail, because, um, you know, and it's, it's hard to offer universal guidance because every program is unique and different. And exactly. And ultimately, what we're telling you is we hope these resources and tools are helpful to you, but we can't tell you what to do with them or how to. Yeah, yeah. No, this is great. And it's very helpful. And it's very helpful to ask the questions that have only existed in my head and (laughs) check out my assumptions. It's been twice now talking through this kind of thing. So I appreciate it. You're very welcome. And um, and also just um, to everybody on the call or who might be listening to this as a recording, um, grappling with these questions can be um, time consuming and even frustrating, but it is important and it will help you. It will help you define your program. It will help you articulate um, what you're trying to do within the confines of this RFP and hopefully be helpful to other funding efforts as well. But as Nicole said, when in doubt, go you know to that sc- scoring guide and think about how your response matches the elements in there. Just a reminder, and and to do that repeatedly and at different times in your process, because sometimes you can interpret something a different way the second or third or fourth time you look at it. Okay, I'm going to keep us moving, but please share more comments and questions in the chat. So we we also wanted to um, emphasize that when we say data, we mean both quantitative data, the things that you can count, and qualitative data or things that are more descriptive. So in our in a previous training, we talked about how quantitative data lets you answer questions about your program, such as how much of something you did, how many times you did it, how many people benefited, or how often you did it. So different kinds of sessions or uh, program activities. But when we're talking about community level data, we also can use um, quantitative data to understand or describe how many people or what percentage of a population is experiencing a quality or a state of well-being or the absence of it. So the, the percent change in a community level indicator of well-being over time is one way to use that, or the the percentages of um, differences in something between groups. So disparities when data are broken down by race or ethnicity or gender or geographic area. And this can be really important information, the counts of things, but so is qualitative data, which helps you explore some questions that might be more nuanced, like why did people participate or not participate in your services? And why did some services or approaches um, work for some people and not others? How can your services and programs become more accessible? Or how well did you deliver the things that you intended to deliver? So when it comes to community level data, we still can use qualitative data to understand why a certain need or inequity exists and how change in that uh, happens, and also to understand the experiences of participants and um, including some broader community voice in what we're what we're learning about our program and its setting. So a place to learn about community level data and find some data that might be relevant to your program is the core results menu on DataShare. This is a tool that's embedded in DataShare. I'm going to do a quick screen share tour in just a moment. And Gisela will be adding the links in the chat if you want to follow along on your screen as well or do some exploring later on your own. And all of these links will be provided to you after today's session. So if you're if it's moving a little faster than you'd like, don't worry, you'll have a chance to, uh, to explore them on your own. So let me do that. Just a moment while I shift here. Okay, so hopefully you are seeing a screen that's the landing page of DataShare. And a couple things to point out here. 
So you can see there's a, a button for um, newly uh, recently updated indicators. So that's helpful to check in on since data share is in a uh, state of continuous improvement and upgrades, right, Eva? Sometimes almost daily. And also that you can view all of this material in Spanish either by clicking here on this button or the translate to, which gives you some other language options besides Spanish. But to get to the core results menu, which is what we're discussing here, the fastest way for me is to go to the local progress page, that tab, and then click on core results menu and see the, we hope, very familiar core conditions graphic with some other materials about core. And if you scroll down, you'll see the results menu that Nicole went over earlier with the um, indicators, the, sorry, the impacts being, impact statements being clickable. So just to show you how this could work, these three to five impact statements under each of the core conditions are the ones we're gonna start working with. So we'll go to lifelong learning and education, that first impact, equitable access to high quality education and learning opportunities. I'm gonna click on that. And then under this impact, again, we're just emphasizing the difference between impact statements, which are broader, and indicators, which are specific. But under that impact statement, which is the one, one of the options that you can pursue with the funding in this RFP, you'll see some indicators such as access to affordable quality educational opportunities. And this one has a variety of ways that you can explore that indicator, including the see more data tab that I'm gonna look at in just a second. Just wanna say again, these indicators, if they're helpful to your program and your, what you're trying to pursue with this funding, great. But if they're not, and you need to find others, that's fine. You are not required to use these, you're not restricted to using these, but you do wanna find indicators that relate to this impact statement, the broader impact statement. The indicators have more latitude. So if these are helpful to you, great. If not, we'll talk about some ways to find some others as well. All right, so let's click on see more data. And now you can see that as we start drilling down and exploring these indicators in more detail, we can find one that talks about children who are in working families that don't have licensed childcare. And once again, I'm gonna click on the See More Data tab. And I'm just gonna show you some features of the indicator pages on DataShare, these and or others. They have some common elements and sometimes they have more available than others. So your mileage may vary, but if we scroll down here, you can see, for example, they will have a measurement period. Hopefully you can see that highlighted. Here it is 2021, and that is telling you how recent the data might be, how recently they were collected and updated. One of the many advantages of data share is that if something is on here, it is the most recent available. So it may not be the most recent for your purposes, but if you go hunting in different places and different websites, you won't find a more recent version of this particular indicator. So that's really, I find that really reassuring when I'm using data share. And then you can also find mostly on these indicator pages, a definition of the indicator. So exactly what is being measured. Up top, you can find some more information about why it's important that can give you some information that could be helpful to making your case or connecting to the impacts. You can also find some comparisons over time. 
You can find out where the data originally came from. And if data are available by a subgroup, in this case, by the type of facility, child care center versus family child care home, you will see it here. Sometimes it's available by race and ethnicity, by age group, by gender, but not always. So that's just a place to look. And then if you keep scrolling down, DataShare just keeps giving you more to explore. So you can see some other indicators that are related to this one that may or may not be part of the core results menu, which is a, a sort of curated shorter list of indicators. So you might start exploring some others that are on DataShare. You can see some other resources here. There are some um, suggested reports, other assessments, other funding opportunities, maybe some countywide plans that could give you some ideas, some toolkits, indices, just a lot of other things to explore. So this I, I call this the rabbit hole section of the indicator page because there are just lots of things to pursue. So again, once you land on an indicator, See, what, see whether these different aspects of it are relevant to you and your program. And if not, scroll down and see if it leads you someplace that is more relevant. So that's one from Lifelong Learning and Education. Now we're gonna go back to the core results menu. And again, just to reinforce how, this, how you get there, scroll down. And let's look at the first impact in thriving families. So here's thriving families. Again, these broader impact statements are clickable. And two of these three are part of the RFP, the increased resilience of children and youth and increased resilience among older and dependent adults. So as Nicole said earlier, in response to questions, um, the children and youth age range has def been defined up to age 24 and the older adults age 60 plus and dependent adults, adults who are struggling to live independently and, and are dependent of any adult age. So let's go to children and youth. So just to walk through that same process we just did, the impact area that you're asked to connect to is this broader one up here. Increased resilience of children and youth. The indicators are ones that are part of the core results menu, but you are not tied to, restricted to, required to use these indicators, the more specific ones. But let's say we wanted to look at youth connectedness to school. So we do, we do some program that is relevant to this. So we're gonna look at more data. And again, on this one, all the same things we talked about before, the measurement period, the source, how recently it's been updated. But on this one, you can see that unlike the previous one that we looked at, this one does have some gender subgroups. So that might be of interest depending on your program. And there's lots more that you could explore on any of these, but we're just trying to give you some highlights of how to navigate through data share and these different resources. So let's say we were working on a program for older and dependent adults instead of children and youth. Again, the impact area, the broader impact area is up here. Impact three, increased resilience among older and dependent adults. The indicators may or may not be the ones that are relevant to you, but if they are, Use them. If they're not, feel free to use others. And here, we're just gonna take a peek at the geographic isolation one. So I'm gonna click on see more data. And now I've got something that's specific to people who are 65 and older who are living alone. And I can again look at the source of the data, the measurement period, et cetera. And this one 
also has many other places we can look and has some other breakouts by region, census place, zip codes, census tracts. And this one, you may have noticed it's 65 and over as opposed to the county's definition of 60 and over. So if you are using that has something that's, a, you're using data that has a different definition or range or um, some other feature that's different from what the RFP is, just make sure you note that and, and be clear if you're using this data point, um, how it affects what you're saying about your program. Maybe you, maybe you serve the same population or maybe you don't. So you wanna just be cautious about matches between them. Okay, let's do one more in healthy environments. And as Nicole mentioned, the impact area under healthy environments that the RFP is highlighting is safe, affordable, accessible recreational spaces. So that's the broad impact statement that you wanna to connect to. And how you connect to it is up to you, but if any of these indicators are useful to you, great. If not, you're not required to use them or restricted to them. But we're just gonna explore since we're here, the access to exercise opportunities. So this is one of the ones that does not have any breakouts that we might be interested in. It's just not available. So that's gonna happen with different kinds of data. And some data are just, they're from multiple sources. So they're just gonna vary in terms of how many uh, breakouts or how recent they are. And in this one, um, in addition to that, we notice something that you may see on some other indicators, which is that this dotted line is saying that the methodology for how this particular indicator um, how the data were collected changed. So maybe they used a different definition, a different survey. So this is a place where you wanna be careful about drawing conclusions about this trend line because there's something different about the way the data were collected that could be affecting the direction or the scope of that change. So just watch out for that on, on your indicators. And let me go back to our slides. So also on data share, but separate from the core results menu, you can find lots of other things that might be relevant to your uh, proposal. And if we're running a little, a little short on time and I wanna preserve some time for questions. So I'll just um, say that on data share, you can look at um, indicators as a whole by location level. It shows you all of a list of all the indicators and which ones might be available by those subgroupings. You can also look at different dashboards that collect information on community well-being. You can look um, for the on the local progress page at some specific um, data sources, you can see here oral health access, the community health improvement plan, different strategic plans, cradle to career are all featured on the local progress page. And there are data spotlights on particular issues that may be relevant to your program and to what you're doing. And again, this may be helpful um, just for this RFP, but also for others. So we wanna make sure you are aware that there's lots more to explore on data share. And you can also um, just try entering your particular um, search term as, as an indicator and see where that leads you. So lots to find on data share. You can also look at demographic data. Um, there's a lot available, again, possibly by geographic area and different demographic characteristics. Some of that is provided by um, Claritas, which can be different from other sources like census data or American Community Survey data. So you wanna just be careful when you're using the demographic data from different sources 
with different years to explain what your source is and what years or you know how recent it is and what what's what you're covering so that the reviewers don't get confused across different data sources that you're using. We'll talk about how to cite data also in just a second because we know that's a challenge with the character counts. I'm just going to briefly review um, a few other sources that we rely on often in um, thinking and learning about some of these core conditions. So for lifelong learning and education, and you'll get all of these links both in the chat and after today's session. Um, these are some of the portals that can yield some really great um, data with different degrees of specificity, but the county's Office of Education, the California Healthy Kids Survey, the Education Data Partnership and kidsdata.org all have great resources about um, learning and education. And they're for older um, uh, um, adults or for um, college age population. So rather than early childhood or, or school age, we have some suggestions from California Competes the community college system gathers a lot of data about uh, people transitioning um, through different career changes, for example. Um, Workforce Santa Cruz County has a lot of labor market data that can be useful. And the Employment Development Department has some county level data available from their state database that's reported. For thriving families, you may have heard us talk in the past about this really helpful framing the pair of ACEs related to adverse childhood experiences and, and adverse um, environments. So this is a model that we learned about a few years ago from the Center for Community Resilience. And it's just a, a way to understand some of the um, systemic racism, white supremacy roots of some of the inequities that we see um, playing out in communities and how to describe the links between those roots and the consequences of them. Um, so since the RFP does talk about um, equity and inequity and asks you to be explicit about those, this might just be a way to think about that and think about the ways that particular um, terms or data can yield a connection, connecting the dots between the structural things that you're looking at and their consequences that your programs might be trying to address. So we're sharing that as a resource. And here it is in Spanish as well. So for example, if you are working in the Thriving Families core condition, you might want to look for sources of data on these adverse experiences or adverse environments for any age group. Or you might be thinking about the resilience terminology that's also part of this. Here's some of that in Spanish. And we just want to point out how these aspects of community resilience and equitable trauma-informed systems and supports are really similar to some other core conditions and impacts that weren't specifically prioritized in the RFP, but the framework really reinforces how interconnected and interdependent the core conditions are. So whether you use this framework or a similar one to think about resilience and how it's defined, we hope this can help you open up some other possibilities for community-level indicators and data sources. So are there websites and data sources that anyone wants to share? These are, these are just some that we've come across and we know there are so many out there. Got some for thriving families. Didn't find as many mm -hmm. for environments. Go ahead. Nicole, sometimes we have found that our community-based organizations or our School partners have data that is nowhere to be found but them. So, for yes. example, County Office of Education actually has some data that is very relevant to the work that we do and didn't know about it until we were in one of their trainings and that we tracked it down. But um, 
it's always worth asking how are how how is the partner measuring or collecting data on their population that they serve and and is it somehow related to what we do that we we found stuff that way that's a great point and um, we have too and it is you're right it's always worth asking and those things change constantly so um, sometimes there are things that are just somebody's collecting and for whatever reason it isn't available on a database or shared but it exactly. but would be if you asked and other times they're new data collections and we just didn't know about them yet so exactly we've also found the same with UCSC a lot of their graduate students have to do certain level of data collection community assessment depending on what 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 uh, their angle is of study and we have found information that way as well that's great. And it's all fair game for this, for this RFP and others. Remember that um, you're asked to provide a, a blend of different kinds of data. And so don't worry about um, so much about exactly um, if, if they're all the same or they're all perfect. They're all informing what you're saying and what you're doing. Denise, go ahead. I see your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to share if there's anyone else on this call who's um, looking at applying for early education. There's a few resources. There's a study done within the county of Santa Cruz about how much subsidized care is available. Um, and then there's the local planning council will identify by zip code where there is the biggest need, where there's like what they consider a child care desert. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has been um, identified as an LPC, which means that they are a there's a childcare desert within the city of Santa Cruz. Um, so if other folks are looking for stuff like that, I'll put my email in the chat um, and I can send people information if they're applying for that topic. Thank you, Denise. That's a very generous offer. And, and thank you for the spirit of sharing um, information more widely with, with, with others who are interested in the same things. Appreciate that. Um, feel free for if you're working in another area um, and have some suggestions to put those in the chat as well and we'll share them um, as part of the materials from today's session. We also just wanted to say that if you happen to be the kind of person who likes to do your own um, tooling around with an Excel spreadsheet and, and analytics, the um, US Census website and the California Department of um, Finance website has all kinds of demographic data, forecasts, et cetera, that you can play with. So you can download things um, for our county from them. We have just a moment for some questions or suggestions. And Nicole, maybe you can help me. I haven't been tracking the chat while I've been speaking. I'm just scrolling through it now to see if there are some questions that have come up. Yeah, I don't think there's any questions in the chat. Okay. How about off chat? Okay. All right, well, let me just do a quick um, overview of citing data, and then we'll try and catch up a little bit on time here. So. Citing your data sources is part of getting all the points you can on that exemplary response part of the scoring rubric. So specifically, it says uses and cites a broad array of community data, stories, and or other types of information to demonstrate knowledge and understanding of the systemic root causes of inequities. Well, that's a lot. And if you've written term papers, reports, et cetera, where you've had to include the full citations of your data sources, you're probably familiar with things like this list where you're trying to um, list absolutely everything about the source, the author, the year, the title, the source, the publisher, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're accessing it online, the full URL, when you accessed it, um, the type of journal. So that's great, but it's unlikely that you're going to have a lot of extra room for that in some of these character counts. Maybe you will, which will be easy, easier. But if you don't, we just wanted to um, 
let people know that when your space is limited, you still have some options. So you can abbreviate um, some of what you're offering, but you want to give enough for a reviewer to have uh, a sense of where your data came from and to have some, your your level of confidence in it. So letting them know that it's recent, that it could be, they're, they're not going to necessarily look up your same data source, but if they really wanted to, they could find it. Um, the glossary says that a reliable um, information slash source is information or sources of data whose origins and methods can be verified or is produced by an entity with a history of producing accurate information related to social services and policy. So at least try to try to include what's here, the, um, the author or whoever created the original source of the data, the year and its title. And you could weave that into a sentence like this example, in 2021, 33% of households in the county had incomes below the real cost measure, and that's from the United Ways of California. So that's um, the year, who created it, and the name of the, the data measure, the real cost measure. So it's not the full citation, but it's enough to let somebody know where it came from and how recent it is. And then just one last set of tips about trying to make sense of this volume of data. For those of you who said we've got a lot and we're just trying to make sense of it and sift through it in the poll, or those of you who hopefully will have a lot after this session and you pursue all those great data share and other rabbit holes, um, getting together with others, whether it's um, colleagues or um, board members or grant writers or whoever is helping you with this, and hopefully you're not doing it by yourself, um, you might be zooming in and out of data. I call that sort of an accordion situation where you're stepping back to see the broader themes and then zooming into detail. You might find some of these kinds of prompts helpful. So comparing what you've got to other places. We talked earlier about regional, state, and national averages. Comparing things to trends over time. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Why do we think that is? Um, disparities, so changes um, across zip codes, um, by race or ethnicity, by age. What could this be and why isn't it there? Um, the equity lens that speaks to all of those things. Um, so, and 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 why that might be the root causes of the historical um, structures and systems that contribute to those inequities. The context. Um, so, we talked about that earlier. Some ways that that the data that you have about your program or what you understand about it might align or differ from some of those broader community-wide data points. And then don't forget the strengths and assets that are part of question five. So what are the things that you see as part of the equation that are strengths even in the midst of adversity and challenge? And so to speak to that, I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole and uh, sorry for running over. Right, all right. So in previous core training sessions, we've mentioned this concept of asset-based or strengths-based framing and offered also a helpful resource from the First Five Center on Children's Policy called Amplifying Our Voices, a Language Guide for Advocates, Care Providers, Policymakers, and Families. And so it's only available in English, but Giselle will post a link to that resource in the chat. That's where we've drawn this information from. And just to provide a quick reminder or recap of um, the things that we covered in the previous training, these are just some reminders that the words and the language we use in proposals and everywhere else, like in our marketing materials and uh, brochures and websites, that the way we frame things can really communicate important aspects of our approaches and the way our organizations work. So these are the asset-based asset framing tips in that guide. Um, so the first one being to lead with shared values. Uh, so try, try it on. Instead of starting your whole proposal describing the problem, try emphasizing a common value first, like a particular policy or program that helps everyone do something we all care about, 
like supporting our family members or um, having good health and well-being. <laughs> and to name the system causing the problem, uh, meaning that you're uh, not just naming it or making it seem like it's up to each individual to make the right choices, but to really acknowledge that, um, you know, the disparity data that we might find, you know, data showing disparities among groups can tell us something about the inequities that exist um, and the people that are affected by them. But that if we don't also name the systems and the structures and things like structural racism uh, or discrimination that, you know, as contributors to those disparities, then we're really only telling a part of the story. And that as you're writing and as you're describing data, uh, take an asset-based approach. So it doesn't mean that you ignore the problem or pretend it doesn't exist or, or gloss over it, but oftentimes in our marketing materials or funding materials or grant applications, we kind of focus uh, more heavily on the problems or needs that exist. And this is saying basically do that and also focus on the assets and strengths that, a, that exist within a community and talk about how you will build upon those. Uh, use people-centered language. So remembering that people are more than just the issues or problems that they face and that we should try to avoid defining people in that way. So instead of saying things like people with diabetes that happen to have a condition and it's just one aspect of their lives, um, that instead of um, you know labeling them or using that label of diabetics, that we actually want to describe them as people with diabetes. So I got that a little <laughs> mixed up there. Um, and then finally, the last tip is to avoid hedging, meaning especially, and this is actually where character limits can be helpful in grant writing. It really forces you to get right to the point and to be really uh, focused in your choice of words, uh, to not have too many extra words that really just dilute the meaning or sometimes cause confusion in what you're trying to say, to, to just really get to what it is that you are trying to get done. So those are the tips. And then in the training, we covered some specific examples, again, drawing from that guide that the first five um, children's policy center created. So we just wanted to show a couple of those examples here as a reminder of if you want to go back and look at the materials from that June 14th training, they are available. Gisela has put the link in the chat uh, and you can download the slides so you can see the rest of the examples here. Okay, so this is another example and I think that's all we will cover for today. Why don't we open it back up for any final questions before we start to wrap up? I saw that Crystal added another suggestion for a data source for the healthy environments, core condition, the Cal and bio screen. Thank you for adding that, Crystal. And I'm actually curious, did anyone come into today's session feeling like, ah, oh, I'm just not finding options or data that I could use my, in my proposal? Did anyone come in feeling like that and walking away feel like at least you've got some ideas to explore further potential data sources to explore further that might be helpful? Melissa says, yes, thank you. You're welcome, Melissa. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions or comments or suggestions in the chat, why don't we move to our closing and just, again, a reminder about what else is coming up. So tomorrow there is a specific training on how to use the online portal for entering and submitting your applications for the core RFP. That one will be led by the human services department staff. We'll be there to provide um, Zoom support to them, but that's HSD that leads that one. 
We're offering another round of the open office hours on July 2nd, where each session focuses on a specific core condition. I think this time around we're starting the 12 o'clock session will be um, on lifelong learning and education and then healthy environments and then thriving families will be the two o'clock session. So again, that's if you've started your writing and you're running into questions and you just want to have an open forum to talk those through, that's a great opportunity to do that. And then our last two structured trainings in July, uh, on July 9th, we're going to be focusing on preparing a program budget and budget narrative. And then July 12th is kind of a wrap up in case you missed it. We'll just cover a few of the highlights from the trainings that we've offered. So if anyone missed something or wants a refresher or wants to talk through like, wait, how do I do that again? Um, that would be the July 12th training. And then again, we're encouraging folks to sign up for their TA sessions if they would like that individualized assistance. Um, so start by signing up for your initial TA session. You'll see a range of dates between now and July 8th. And then after that, we'll work with everyone who has signed up for an initial TA session to schedule your second session. And last but not least, we would like to uh, get your feedback about today's training. And so you'll see links in the chat, or if you have a smartphone nearby with a camera app, you can scan the QR code and respond to the survey in either English or Spanish. We do really appreciate uh, all the feedback. Uh, it helps us understand and learn you know, what worked well, but also anything that we could do to continuously improve. And we do um, factor in those feedback comments as we plan our uh, next training session. So. Just want to thank everyone for being here for today. We hope it was useful, that it gives you some ideas and options to look into as you continue writing your applications. And we'll hang out here for a few minutes more in case anyone else wants to um, say anything else or ask anything else. <laughs>